Okay, so uh, what I wanted to do was a, an overview of uh, data management processes, um, and I'm going to cover how uh, the collection and control and management of and retention of clinical trial uh, data uh, is important for data integrity. Also, investigator uh, control and uh, the importance of computer systems validation will come in, and looking at aspects of compliance. Uh, with data management processes. So hopefully um, this will help you understand how application of GCP and data integrity principles can um, help uh, your data management processes to be compliant. Um, we'll identify risks for compliance and hopefully some of the findings I give you will uh, outline some uh, issues to avoid pitfalls. So I have some slides on ICH GCP. Um, I hope that you're, well, my speaker seems to keep disappearing. I hope you're all familiar uh, with GCP. I'm not going to read all these out, um, but it's what uh, these principles are international standards and uh, apply to all global trials for pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so I'm not going to read them, just uh, they're there to support my presentation. Uh, this first one is quite what I'd like to just mention about the CRF is the method by which uh, the investigator reports their data to the sponsor. So in the good old days of paper, uh, the database was held by the sponsor. Um, the investigator site entered the data into a paper CRF. The monitor took the top copy, entered into a database, and, and then uh, any queries were resolved by paper clarification forms or, or data um, uh, query forms, they were called. So then came the ECRF, and this time the um, actual uh, data was uh, entered from source data directly into the ECRF, and the audit trail replaced the, uh, the query forms, the paper forms. So the important thing is, does the audit trail uh, have that information in that the query form needs to? So this uh, GCP requirement uh, sets out that the investigator should authorize the personnel who are entering the data and making changes to the CRF. And this also includes the sponsor um, uh, in this process as well. Because the CRF is becoming more complex, there are examples where the sponsor is using the CRF appropriately, for example, workflows for data queries uh, and extracting uh, central monitoring data. But also, sponsors are also using the CRF now for entering causality and expectedness assessments into the TMF, into the, sorry, the CRF, and also uh, deviations. We've also seen that IoT systems are also collecting, um, also collecting clinical data um, that is being then transposed into the CRF, um, uh, and, and therefore uh, sort of via a, an integration process. So there are fields in the CRF that have been populated via an IoT system. And are these viewable to the investigator and therefore part of the CRF? So the CRF hasn't been filled in by uh, the investigator. So in these cases, the edit rights may potentially be given to the sponsor, and that could increase risk for data integrity, uh, because as the investigator authorized these personnel to do that. So for item one, we see that the IoT is integrated, uh, and, and the investigator is not having to enter this twice. And what happens if the uh, investigator can edit the data in the CRF? Um, how does that feed back into the IoT system, and what problems can that cause for data integrity? The IoT system is functioning as a, as a CRF. So has the functionality of the IoT been assessed against GCP principles? or CRFs, and, and that's usually not been the case. We expect any electronic system in clinical trials to be assessed against the regulatory requirements and GCP 
a better way to integrate data is to use electronic transfers into the, the database, uh, which is uh, behind the CRF uh, and doesn't have the associated data entry screens uh, with it. So the transfer of the, the data into the database uh, facilitates perhaps creating an end analysis data sets. But it's also most useful for doing validation, so you can transfer laboratory data into the database and then do data checks against the CRF data. So the transfer of data electronically does require quite um, detailed planning and careful processes to ensure that it's done uh, accurately. Uh, so that the data is attributable to the correct fields and has all the correct attributes like the type of data, uh, length and formats, et cetera. So we expect to see a, a detailed specification and that that's been validated. So some uh, data uh, may go into the database from still from paper records. They may have some uh, diaries if an electronic EPRO is not being used. And in these cases, um, uh, this, this could be done by entering the data similarly to what used to be done for um, CRFs themselves, but it's um, advised that that's done in a separate system to the main eCRF for the trial. We also, uh, as a result of the validation using vendors, that the query process is also uh, put in place so we can reconstruct how that was done with the uh, vendors' uh, systems as well. So findings that we have with this is that um, uh, failure to implement some of the expectations I've set out, so the IRT being used as a CRF. Um, problems with data transfer that there's been uh, insufficient testing so that the uh, system's picking up the wrong data or, or it's been tried to be put into the wrong type of field. So for example, character field going into a numeric uh, field and so it doesn't work or the data being mapped incorrectly. Also, um, quite often we see that the lack of documentation for uh, how the queries was resolved uh, with the vendors. And if you compare that process to the detailed process used for investigator sites, it's often uh, far inferior to that, that system. An example to uh, an investigator site I did um, we had the laboratory data in the study report and in the CRF. But it wasn't clear how it, how it got in there because there was no field in the CRF for the investigator to enter that data. And that had been done by the sponsor based on local lab results sent by the investigator side. So they were collected by the monitor. Um, but what we uh, couldn't see was when we were at the investigator site, what documents had actually been sent. And when we reviewed some of the scanned images of the lab report, of the sponsor, they, a lot of them still had patient identifiable information in them because they were lab reports. So the issue was that the process for how that source data would be captured wasn't documented and wasn't reconstructable. The GCP has requirements for audit trails, uh, data changes are authorized. Um, it also has a clear requirement that any source data in the CRF has to be specified in the protocol and that investigators are controlling all of their documents, uh, have continued access to the CRF and the sponsor mustn't have exclusive control of the CRF. So back in the old days of paper, um, when I started as a CRA, the um, top copy of the document of the CRF was uh, sent to the sponsor, and the investigator always maintained a contemporaneous bottom co copy, so it was always possible to compare that to source data at site. So when CRF, ECRFs uh, came into, into force, um, I haven't seen an ECRF that mimics the contemporaneous copy at the investigator site like paper used to do. Um, so. Uh, the investigator in this system has lost control of the transcribed data in the CRF and the sponsors got that because they, they have that on their server. If there is source data in the CRF, which is allowed by GCP, as I, as I just stated, uh, 
There's no opportunity to, to do any data verification. Investigators lost control of the CRF, and the sponsors now got exclusive control of source data. And so there's an opportunity for any of that data to be uh, changed. So we have the uh, gold, gold disks on the diagram. And this model for ECRF being unacceptable. I think most sponsors have actually gathered that now and starting to use independent vendors for the, uh, the for hosting the data so it's not in the control anymore. The, the provision of the data needs to be at the end of the trial prior to the access being revoked. Um, and, and that plus the, a full audit trail could re replace the, the contemporaneous copy. However, the use of the independent vendor to prevent the sponsor control can be undermined if the distribution of the disks at the end of the trial are via the sponsor. And we've seen that uh, uh, that happens because there's obviously a risk again of that data being changed, particularly if the vendor can delete the data as well. The independent vendor is um, critical to the uh, CRF uh, systems um, because the uh, process I described by the sponsor host the data doesn't really reflect the paper system it's, it's, it's replacing because of the lack of the contemporaneous copy. The question is um, for you to think about as sponsors is uh, what is independent so if the trial is being conducted by a CRO who is doing all the activities of the clinical study or the clinical operations activities, is there an increased risk to data integrity by them also hosting the data as well? And the uh, miti uh, mitigations that can be put in place to prevent uh, risks, uh, to reduce the risk of problems with data integrity uh, can be uh, mitigated by implementing uh, audit trail uh, review make sure there are strict uh, access controls on the systems and um, particularly uh, regarding changes to back end and this is where a back end change is where you can make a change to a data table in the database uh, via the back end of the system that's not captured in an audit trail so uh, a lot of the CRF systems I've seen they don't have table level audit trails review switched on Instead, they only have it at the front end, so you could somebody could change data in a table without it being detected. And lastly, the disks themselves could be protected by encryption or some sort of checksum uh, system on, on the disk. So EMA and EU, uh, MHRA inspections have seen lots of findings uh, in this regard. Uh, so we've seen examples where the sponsor still owes the database. Uh, commonly we see that the disks are distributed by the sponsor and not the vendor. Um, the disks themselves don't have all of the data, so they don't have the audit trails on them. And even the disks provided back to the sponsor just contain flat files and PDFs and don't have all the, the data as data sets. Another issue we've seen is that the investigators not having oversight of account setup uh, for people entering data into the system that that's controlled by the sponsor so given that the investigator is required to authorize people who edit and access and to data into the CRF if the sponsor setting up all the accounts how does the investigator oversee who's entering data into their CRF and often there's no involvement in the investigator in that process and lastly, we see investigators sign to say they've reviewed their data and it's all correct um, and sign a document, but they've never actually looked at the disk them themselves. We've seen um, it, it's important to uh, manage changes to clinical data so they're done in a compliant manner. So we see examples where the investigator authorization of changes is not being obtained, for example, sponsors do self-evident correction changes without the investigator knowing what they are, and the back-end changes I already mentioned. 
Surprisingly, in some large organizations, I've seen that uh, virtually all the data management staff have edit rights to change the data in the uh, CRF. And that's happened at uh, several uh, large sites, although they have uh, corrected that uh, I think fairly quickly. So, and again, this comes back to the investigator authorizing who's entering data into the CRF. It's also important that there's uh, the audit trail uh, as well for uh, managing changes to data that's not in the CRF, so uh, any EPRO, uh, lab data, etc. So I just want to uh, spend a few minutes on certified copies, uh, sorry, on eSource, and just wanted to remind you about some of the uh, requirements in GCP for certified copies. Uh, to be able to verify information and also patient confidentiality requirements. And that investigators should oversee third parties involved in their study tasks, uh, maintain records of pertinent information for trial subjects, implement ALCOA, and that all data should be consistent with source data. So some models for uh, eSource are one, you could use a tablet, which has an eCRF that ca captures source data, and then that could be put into the electronic health record. You could pull data out of the electronic health record directly via some tool, or you could have an interim database of the relevant data and pull that from the investigator side. So what are the GCP things to think about in terms of compliance for, for these systems? So for all of them, what is the CRF? tablet situation, it's probably straightforward, but for the other, there is no real CRF. Is it, does it really become the specification document for what data is going to be pulled out of the electronic health record? Is source data verification still needed? If we believe that the extraction tool is, is, very, is validated to extract only the right data, then is that sufficient or does SDV still need to be done in some way? How do we manage to, uh, to see that all the uh, data changes that are made to the source data are still under the control of the investigator post-extraction? In all of these process, computer systems validation is the key uh, thing to make sure that the process works, and that has to be really robust and thoroughly tested to make sure that they, they work properly. So in particular for Model one, where you've got the tablet collecting uh, source data as an eCRF. Is it the entire trial visit, or is it just some specific data for the trial? The real issue is that if it's all the clinic visit, we'd expect that to be in the electronic health record, because other healthcare professionals will need that data to be able to treat the patient as well. So you can't just take it out uh, at all their normal clinical practice and not put it in the electronic health record. And then how do you put it back in the electronic health record how to ensure it's a certified copy? Are you putting it back into specific data fields or just putting a flat PDF? And if it's a different to how it would normally appear in the electronic health record, would the other healthcare professionals be able to see it? And these other problem is you're removing data that's been anonymized, but to put it back, you need to de-anonymize it and make sure it goes back into the right, right patient's electronic health record as well, so that creates other uh, potential issues for data integrity. And of course, we need to make sure that the investigator is maintaining control of all this data and that the sponsor's not got exclusive control. Looking at those, some of those issues, it may be more appropriate that uh, the source data in the CRF is for very trial-specific questionnaires and not for a lot of healthcare data that's collected as routine, or, or perhaps for uh, phase one volunteer trials where there's no electronic health record for the data to be transferred to. For the other two uh, processes where you're pulling data out of the electronic health record, the main issue is how you pull in the right patient's data and issues regarding patient confidentiality. 
um, so that would require uh, validation and probably model three reduces the risk of that. The other issue is that electronic health records are, aren't very standardized, they're all very different from different sites and, and different hospitals and to validate a system that has access to all of those different systems across a, a multi-center trial um, would be difficult and you may uh, therefore would be restricting your sites in terms of depending what electronic health record they have. Uh, CPRD is a division of the MHRA and they have um, done this successfully so they are able to have a network of GP uh, practices across the UK who are signed up to have data extracted directly from electronic health records and, and they do offer services to sponsors to, to run trials in this type of environment. But it may be that they're more suitable for uh, late phase, pragmatic phase tr four trials where the data collection is fairly minimal. If um, the data you're pulling out of the system requires it to be recorded in a different way in the electronic health record as well, uh, how, how does that impact on the standard clinical procedures of the site? So uh, they may have to change their processes in order to facilitate you collecting your, your data. And, and lastly, um, in, in Europe we've discussed this and we see that it's uh, unacceptable for the sponsor to be able to browse the electronic health records of patients at sites remotely because we don't, really don't know who's doing that at the sponsor site. So let's look at uh, investigate a site from GCP uh, point of view further that uh, the site should have adequate facilities and equipment, so that would include data collection um, equipment and also that the data in the CRF can be verified against the source data and again, changes to the CRF are authorized by an investigator. So these themes are quite uh, strong in, in GCP. So for data integrity, it's really important at the investigator site that it's clear where all the source data is and where it's held. And it shouldn't, shouldn't just be the monitor responsible for that. The data management should be interested in, in that too. It's really recommended that an accurate source data agreement is put in place um, because uh, quite often the source data is in more than one electronics and system and also in paper systems. Uh, so it, it really helps define where all this is. If the CRF is sourced, then it should be corroborated in the protocol um, that the, that's consistent with the source data agreement. Also, um, a lot of GCP focuses on the CRF uh, data. The EPRO um, systems are also uh, used extensively and the control of data changes to those is also important um, and that the investigator can authorize changes to those if they're supported by electronic health records that show the subject's involvement. So sometimes things can be justifiably changed and we have seen cases where the change has been overruled by the sponsor, so the investigator's control of the data has been removed. So many findings are that the uh, monitor hasn't really identified all the locations of the source data. A lot of times we're seeing now that um, monitors are relying on printouts from the electronic health record. And whenever we see these and look at them, we have access to the electronic health record and compare what they're looking at. We often find there are gaps and inconsistencies, so they're not actually doing SDV against the right documentation. So direct access should be provided. And also, doing all this printing, trying to maintain a certified paper copy, places a huge burden on the investigator site staff to do that, and we should try to avoid it. Um, we, ha we do in, in the UK have a position statement with the Department of Health on the electronic health records uh, which has been cascaded to all NHS hospitals because one of the problems we've seen is that when the system is being procured, the requirements for research in GCP haven't been uh, uh, considered as part of that process. <laughs> 
self-stated verifications taken place and we're still seeing consistencies, then obviously we're concerned about the re monitoring requirements. And, and we've also seen that monitors sometimes aren't aware that source is in the CRF. So we've seen examples where um, CRFs are about SAE reporting modules and that the site has been reporting data directly in there as source data and then writing a summary in the electronic health record. So doing it the opposite way to what the sponsor thought they were doing. The worst case seen for that was that the uh, SAE data had been entered by a nurse, then reviewed by uh, staff at the pharmacovigilance uh, section of the sponsor who weren't medically qualified. So in, in that case, there was a risk that an, an SAE could be escalated to a SUSO and reported to us with no medical review at all, either at the investigator site or, or at the sponsor. We've also seen staff sharing passwords um, people who have granted access to the ECRF without the investigator's authorization. I've already mentioned that the investigator's uh, authorization for e-diaries, e-pro has been overruled by the sponsor. Uh, we often see that all the data from third parties is not at the investigator site, so the e-pro data and all its audit trails isn't provided to the investigator. And Monitors aren't actually looking at the true source data. So, uh, for example, we had a trial where you had uh, audio recordings transcribed onto paper, and the monitor never looked at the original or listened to the original recordings, or they rely on reports from the CT scanning department that never go to the CT scanning department to look at the actual scans and the measurements on, on the scans. Example here of going to true source data, why it's important, is a, a spectrum of urine bile acids. And this, this graph was translated by the wisdom of the investigator into an ordered categorical scale. And the scale was then the primary endpoint of the trial. How he did that was not. Um, documented and validated before he did it. And there was nothing in the marketing authorization application that described it either. Um, and the, finally, the scores uh, were assigned when the investigator knew what, exactly what treatment the uh, patient had received. So during the inspection, I selected a random uh, range of spectra and asked the investigator to uh, grade them. Uh, and interestingly, six out of ten were inconsistent with what they put in the CSR, so that particular endpoint was judged as completely unreliable uh, because it could, couldn't be reproduced. GCP also requires that computer systems are validated. So what we expect to see uh, is that all the retention of the software validation or, or the sponsor maintains access to the software validation, that the validation of the trial specific configuration, uh, that should be part of the trial master file. What the models use for validation is up to the sponsor. So some use waterfall and some uh, use agile methods, but that does impact on the documentation that's available. And quite often now we see that the validation document is that documentation is actually in a computer system itself that manages the whole validation uh, process. So it's not really just piles of paper. You have to look at computer systems to look at validation of computer systems. Uh, this gives a list of some documents that you might uh, uh, generate as part of validation process and we want to see. It's not a comprehensive checklist because it depends on the processes of the uh, sponsor. So MHRA um, has undertaken about a dozen um, specific inspections of vendors who provide e-systems such as RT, ePro and eCRF and also looked at these validation processes in sponsors as well. FDA have observed 
think all of these inspections and also uh, inspectors from the Danish inspector have also uh, joined uh, two inspections with us as well. A lot of the issues are about documentation and, and then you have to come to a decision about whether the problems in the documentation are so bad uh, that you have to declare whether the system's actually in the validated state or not. So this can range from a non-commercial CRE, CRF, which was the only validation documents was a folder of emails between the developer and the chief investigator saying we've released a new version, have a look at it, what do you think, and then an email coming back with a few problems. Um, or, or we actually have seen where some commercially available software that she was used by lots of sponsors, the validation document couldn't be tied up in terms of linking uh, final specifications, ensuring they were all tested and final validation report. And, and we actually concluded that that wasn't demonstrated to be in a validated state. For ECRS, we often see that uh, all the uh, testing's not being done, uh, particularly of edit checks, uh, and or some key areas haven't been tested at all. Um, for the edit checks, um, we sometimes see they've been delayed in, and excluded from the validation, and then they've not been actually applied to the ECRF until later, so it's sort of released on a part functionality, because it's not met its entire functionality that was stated. Um, and what happens if you apply those edit checks late is that you can then not evaluate data quality in a timely manner, and you don't implement any CAFA soon enough. One of the real problems is none of the documentation um, links to a protocol version. That's a fairly common finding. The protocol is the key specification document uh, for the trial ECRF and other e-systems. So we want to tie it back to the protocol. We just don't want to see a specifications document that's approved by the sponsor. The ECRF and any other system has to be built in compliance with the protocol. And remember, in the EU and the UK, it's a legal requirement to comply with the approved protocol. And this is why we don't accept any waivers for, for protocol. So an example of inconsistency uh, was fairly straightforward that when we were looking at the CSR data, we couldn't match up the number of pain scores with the data that was in some fields in the in the e diary the paper e diary at the site and that's because the ecrf had, hadn't been designed with enough fields to record the number of data points that a patient had put in their paper diary and because the last data point was missing at day 35 and the primary endpoint was the mean of the last seven day scores that, that meant that the primary endpoint of the trial was also questionable and meant the sponsor had a lot of work to do then to uh, confirm that the, the trial results went effective. One of the issues, we, well, so issues that we see with the CRFs are uh, there's a, often a rush to get the CRF out the door. So things being re re released on draft specifications rather than a final one, released prior to all the validation having been completed or, or incomplete, for example, no edit checks. We also see problems with managing change control to the documentation once it's been released. Particularly, it, there doesn't seem to be a, a general requirement to assess the risk the data integrity if you're changing your ECRF and your database partway through a trial that you could potentially lose or, or change data if you don't do that correctly. And lastly, a, a significant issue is making sure that the ECRF is consistent with the approved protocol, particularly uh, when you do amendments. Again, Remember, it's a legal requirement to comply with the protocol. We've also seen this issue for IRT systems. So we've seen a case where the IRT system wasn't calculating the, the dose of an IMP in the same 
way that was specified in the protocol. It was inconsistent. So if you don't control the process in relation to uh, the protocol amendments, you can have two situations. One, that you release your ECRF before your protocol is approved. Or secondly, you tell a site to implement uh, the protocol, the, the new protocol amendment, but the ECRF is still based on the old one, and so there's a problem with following it. So a simple example here is changing the age range of patients as an eligibility criteria. So in, in scenario one, you could recruit a patient in the new age range would be ineligible according to the approved protocol at the time. Or in situation two, you could tell the investigator to recruit these new age range patients, uh, but the CRF won't allow them to progress because the CRF is saying that they're ineligible and won't allow you to go any further in the, in the, in the CRF. So it just emphasizes the need to make sure that there's a, a process for controlling the software and the release of the ECRF IRT systems with the approved protocol, and we're finding that's a common issue uh, wherever we go. Also, at e-system vendors, we see lots of problems with uh, contracts with the sponsor. Um, these really um, uh, have been consistent, I think, across all of the ones that we've looked at. So. Some vendors don't believe they should comply with GCP. Uh, that's the sponsor's responsibility, even though they're hosting all the data uh, for the trial. Um, they don't have any processes to manage the protocol, uh, making sure they have the final protocol, or making sure they have access to any approvals from the sponsor to show that they've got the approved protocol. They don't have enough detail on what data is going to be retained and by who, and making sure that the sponsor gets all the necessary data that's required and not just flat PDFs. All of them don't consider essential documents in trial master files, so the e-vendors have essential documents relating to the validation of the systems, and it's not clear who's going to keep those for how long, which ones are kept, which ones are retained to the sponsor. And often the security and the location of the servers that for the cloud data storage aren't specified. GCP, um, as um, Jean said this morning, that require quality systems uh, to be replaced for reliability of decision making. These couple of diagrams are from the MHRA GCP guide that summarize the data management processes. And, and this could uh, show you where uh, data quality and consistency can be checked. So we're looking for uh, quality systems that um, govern these particular processes. So decision making, as, as Jean said, is really important regarding regulatory decisions and uh, looking at what the quality of the data is required to be for that. But another uh, one I'd like to point out is for dose escalation. Um, in order to escalate a group of patients onto a higher dose, do you really want to do that without knowing that the data is accurate and putting those patients at risk? But a lot of sponsors do. So, what we found is our accredited phase one units, some of which do patient trials in multi-center situations, they, they apply GCP and want to do QC on the data using dose escalations, but the sponsors don't have any processes to do that, or the other sites don't, and so uh, the sponsor wants to escalate on uh, unclean data, uh, and that has caused problems for them, uh, and we will be um, publishing an MHRA blog dose escalation requirements to re-emphasize this, this issue. In terms of defining your quality, it should be import, uh, done before the trial and there are various documents that that could be done based on a risk assessment. Sometimes there are some data you could live with errors in it, uh, so you could use uh, ongoing safety data for AEs, for example, without knowledge that they've been sourced out data verified, 
on an ongoing basis. So cleaning data, again, needs to focus on the data that matters for the reliability of the trial results based on a risk assessment. If you're doing any form of sampling processes for QC, then we'd expect to see escalation processes in place in case there's a problem discovered with the, with the data. Also, a lot of organizations are using sample-based SDV now as well. Um, what this means is that the statisticians apply a, a schema to which data, which visits will be checked, and that varies from different patients. So you can't just rely on all the tick boxes in the ECRF that the SDV is being completed anymore because it varies from patient to patient. Some will be blank on, on purpose. And what we've found is that when we've asked the question, how do you confirm that the risk-based source data verification that you planned for your monitoring has been complied with as part of your final data quality check, um, nobody's done that check can't show you any documentation how they've complied with their risk-based SDV when it's a sample basis. For coding, uh, we also expect to be re recreate the process of how AE's medical history, etc., was coded, uh, particularly any coding that was done manual and any changes to the coding that were made following a, a medical review. So, example of uh, data validation issues. Um, one was where a trial uh, required the calculation of a DAS28 score in rheumatoid arthritis. So the CRF had all of the data that you needed to calculate the score, but the data validation didn't calculate it to check that the patient was eligible. So the information that the sponsor had wasn't actually used, and it was a quite a key check to check your patients met the criteria. Another example was where a trial used an IMP in a scanning process, and the endpoint was whether the post-treatment plan was changed as a result of the scan. Um, and it was an open-label uh, trial. And obviously, one way to change a positive result in the change of the post-treatment scan was to amend the initial plan, and nobody thought to check the initial plan been changed uh, since the uh, scan. And when uh, they did look at that, they actually found that a lot of the uh, pre-treatment plans were actually entered into the ECRF after the scan, and some of them had been changed. So it required going back to source data to check that the, all the there was some contemporaneous evidence for the pre-treatment plan, and there were still some uh, that they couldn't verify, even though it said 100% SDV. And that could have been avoided having to do it as part of the inspection finding by having a process to check that um, during the actual trial conduct. So deciding your data is clean and ready for analysis involves lots of activities. So these are just a few examples here, such as making sure all the data queries uh, are resolved. It's a really Im important um, Part of the process to get to this step that you have to with the integrity of the data you're going to use for analysis at database lock. So for these processes that are all coming together to declare finalization, uh, we'd expect to see that there's some documentation to demonstrate they've all been done. Uh, sometimes you ask the question and they, they can't show you anything in particular to show how, how that decision was made. And we also um, like to see uh, the evidence of a lock, uh, not just from a form signed by somebody to say we're ready to lock, but we actually request evidence from the, in the system, from audit trails and logs, uh, to show when the, uh, the lock, lock was actually applied to the data. And then we expect the, the process by which the data are extracted also to be uh, validated. Any unlocking um, to the database subsequently should be strictly controlled. And Gail gave an example earlier about uh, how, that, uh, how that wasn't done for one particular inspection. And the process, the sequential 
review in terms of looking at the data for deciding analysis population should be done before unblinding and also the statistical analysis plan and SAP should also be finalized prior to lock. So we look at that sequential process of how that works around the, the database lock plan. And we also expect investigators to sign off data for regulatory submissions. So on inspections we have findings regarding the locking process described in SOPs aren't being followed. So some parts of it say pharma Vigilance reconciliation hasn't been completed and it's been difficult to reconstruct all the activities. We also see problems with the lock itself in terms of it doesn't actually lock the data. So we had an example where the lock removed edit rights from all the investigators in the ECRF but didn't uh, remove entry rights. So data had been extracted but the investigators have carried on entering uh, data into the ECRF after the lock. We also uh, want to look at the control of the data that comes out of the database in terms of its continued uh, protection uh, and we look at the uh, timing of that data in terms of its file properties against the data from the system as to when the database was actually locked to check that it was actually done after the lock was applied to the system. Sometimes we see that the data extraction is very fluid with different data sets being extracted over different times and it's been hard to see how that process was controlled in a way in terms of locking individual data sets as part of the lock process. So an example of a lock from a little while ago now uh, was that we saw that the data was extracted from a, a database in December and that was then used in a CSR, it was in a submission to the EMA for a licensing variation. But when we looked at the documentation and audit trail we saw that the actual pharmacovigilance reconciliation was in January there were some data changes made to the database following that and then that was when the data was actually locked. So we then got a CSR with data that could be unreliable in terms of the safety information. It So again that led to the sponsor having to do a lot of work at quite a pressured time in the application process in order to update the CSR with new data was told that out of the 200 trials that that was the only one that had happened, happened to. So I don't know, it's just lucky picking <laughs> on my part or unlucky picking on their part, I guess. Um, also, uh, GCP requires uh, non-compliance to be identified uh, and also report a serious breach as well. Non-compliance can affect the integrity of the data. So if can you rely on your efficacy data if patients haven't complied with the treatment regime set out in the protocol? So it must be assessed as part of that. So in the sponsors processes, we expect a really robust process for gathering all the non-compliance for all, from all the different functional areas. There's a, a, an assessment of that uh, as part of review of data uh, for analysis populations, for example. Uh, so any categorizations that are applied to deviations are clearly documented in that and that CAP has applied as well and any reports to the regulatory authority if it was a serious breach made. So we have seen that uh, a situation where the sponsor applied the criteria for deciding per protocol eligibility was for the analysis populations was applied to the data and when the output came the medical monitor overruled 80% of it but you wouldn't actually know that uh, from the documentation without actually going into the detail of the system. Also CSRs always contain a statement saying you conducted the study to ICH GCP 
Um, does anybody ever look at that statement to see whether it's true? So, um, we often find critical findings on inspection. Um, so it wasn't complied with, but did you know that? Did you know the issues? Did anybody uh, qualify that statement that it actually was a problem? GCP also requires you to be able to trace the processing of data. I'm not going to go into stats analysis now because that's quite heavy going, but this is a really simple summary of statistical analysis whereby you're taking data, raw data, applying programs to do data steps, creating new uh, data sets, and applying programs to do analyses. And, and these are the sorts of programs that would create your C disk data sets, for example. So it should be able to possible through your retain documentation and programs to, to track data through all these processes. So we should be able to go from the CSR backwards or from the raw data from the database forwards. So that means keeping all your uh, files in terms of programs, permanent data sets, log files, all the QC programs that have been generated and the log files with those and making sure that they're, they're done. And what we found is that that's often not done. So there's missing data sets, missing files. Program editors are inconsistent with the version brought into the system. So the, the date time, time stamps in Windows, for example, of the program uh, are after the um, version header in the program so in, and after the QC of that program. So it indicates that the program may have changed. And also we see overwriting of files quite a lot by subsequent runs of, of, of the program. Lastly, I'd like to just talk about um, retention of data. So um, GCP uh, has various quotes on that. So it means that all the documents and data and computer files in data management that are generated should be retained in the TMF. And this applies to all clinical trials. Where it's retained is up to you as a sponsor. You could agree to that your vendor keeps it. But you must make sure that long-term availability is assured and take into account the type of file that you're dealing with as well, whether it's a static flat file or a dynamic file. It's really no longer the case of being able to put documents in a box and sending them off site for 25 years. It's much more complicated than that. So um, in the EU, we're currently writing a new guidance document on electronic systems in clinical trials. So I'm involved in that uh, with my colleagues uh, from Denmark, Germany, and the Netherlands with support from EMA, where we having a meetings with stakeholder groups, uh, discussing some of the issues in electronic systems and data retention. And uh, what we're thinking really is now that it's a, archiving has to be managed. So if you look at the ECRF as an example, it may be that, uh, it should be, that during the life phase, the active system can be inspected. Once you get to database lock, have a locked active system and that could be the case during the key risk area for inspection in, in the red. And then you might have to move to different files being stored. So you could have files that allow the system to be recommissioned after it had been decommissioned perhaps. Or later on you might be able to have files that allow you to transfer it to a different system. Or you might be able to use an emulator. Sure, you can get games from the 1980s that you can play on software and platforms that they weren't on then. That could be applied to ECRF, so for example. That you could emulate ECRF software that was available now in 2009. And eventually you might end up with just flat files where the system could be described by a series of files that would be quite hard to, to reconstruct. This always means that you're going to have to manage the system, manage migrations, manage software. Gail mentioned floppy disks. 
going to happen to DVDs? Are we going to have um, clouds at investigator sites for storage of data in the future, for example? Um, the electronic archiving is already causing problems. Um, we see uh, DVDs at the investigator site uh, where it's incomplete. We can't decipher audit trails. Um, PDF files are being stored, so we can't get the data as data sets anymore. And remember that uh, when we want data sets, if we recommission, we want the system to be recommissioned, and often the contracts with vendors uh, don't allow this, so it leads to long delays in us being able to get the audit trails as data sets. And we find that sponsors' procedures aren't very uh, thorough in describing the process. So that, that's all I wanted to cover. I'm not going to ask you to answer these questions, but hopefully these are the things you'd be able to answer from what I've said and will be covered in the um, uh, workshop tomorrow.